Go ahead, let's do it. Okay. You don't need an intro from me at all? Uh, it'd be helpful. Okay. Well, tell me when you want to say something. Uh... Ron Young. Yeah? Now? Hi, I'm Ron Young. I'm the pop music writer for the San Antonio Light. And today I'm going to be interviewing Iggy Pop, one of the progenitors of punk rock music, or rock music in general. Uh, two words seem to come to mind. Hi, I'm Iggy Pop, and I'm waking up in the morning. This is morning for Iggy. Yeah, two words seem to come to my mind whenever I know about your performance, and one is a sense of danger, and the other is surprise. You seem to be having a little bit of both whenever you perform, a lot more than most rock performers do. Yeah, well, I found so little in life as it's, as it's, as it's supposed to be really lived, you know? No fucking, you know, no kicks, so I get, them, I get mine in my work. You seem to push reality's boundaries and show business together on stage. Uh, is that on and off. <laughs> yes. On and off. On and off, yeah. I think I've got a, year, I've got a good year left in me, you know. A good anyway, year? Yeah. <laughs> sort of like football players, I guess. Uh, or no, I mean before the, before the, big, big, the big trip. Up that, there with Brian and right, Jim, I right, guess. That's right, you know. You want to talk a little bit about your new album, uh, Zombie Birdhouse? Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's, I've... I, I was influenced by got some. Uh, I was influenced by Haitian art a lot, actually. I saw a Haitian a Haitian art exhibition in Berlin, Germany. By Haiti. Yeah, Haiti. Okay, Haiti. not not H Asian. H I A T I, which is the western half of the island of Hispaniola, the eastern half of which is the Dominican Republic. And uh, Haitians were the first uh, the first successful slave rebellion in uh, in uh, against an empire in history, mm. more in history which is when Napoleon had his back turned with Russia, they snuck in there and took over. Unfortunately, now all they do is enslave each other, which <laughs> is a terrible thing. Now, is most of this stuff on your album, or is this uh, well, just no, your influence? Well, no, I was hanging out down there, and I, I, was, I used to just go to hang out there. First, I went to see the art one time, and then I just fell in love with the place. And, the, and it influenced the, I mean, what is an album? It's like you said, this one feels different, but what's different? You can never put your, you can never say, well, uh, let's see, because I went to Germany, I wrote a D chord. I mean, so what? I can write a fucking D chord anywhere I want to. You know what I mean? It's like sitting a holiday in and make, uh, make great art if I want to. But, but there's, there was something, when I saw the, the, when I saw the depression, the total depression, and total misery, and uh, total impotency to which in human individuals can, how far people can really be pushed. Uh, then I started thinking about the connections between that and here, and I said, wait a minute, this is the same, same thing. <laughs> and so I just wrote these songs about, I was reading Jack London at the time, too, it's where, where Eater Be Eaten comes from. Yeah. I've just been feeling very savage, like, come on, you want to fuck with me? Fuck with me, come on. It's sort of like that, you know? And a bit, I've been feeling a bit of a moving target for the various groupies and malingerers and drug dealers of the world. <laughs> sounds, like a, sounds like a lot so, of taxi driver. So, well, it's a, well, hey, you know, so it's, uh, you know, and so it's, that's the sort of subject that's covered on the album. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's produced by Chris Stein, the ex-leader of Blondie, and yeah. uh, it's on his Animal Record label. Well, that's fun. That was a great experience because okay. it had nothing to do with, uh, I've still not signed a contract with Animal. Uh, I don't it's like a one-shot like deal? It's as many shots as we want to. We'll probably make another one. Is Animal sort we of a talking. refuge for uh, people like that's your type of music? Chris, yeah, that's how Chris conceived it, as a kind of a zoo for people who, uh, you know, I was just over at his house just before I went on this tour. I went over to say hi to him and Debbie, and they, he was showing me. He was really excited. Like a girl had sent in a Crayola drawing uh, for the gun to the send it sent it to the gun club, right? Which is yeah. one of the other one of the animal acts. Yeah, and uh, and and it was, he liked it so much. He's, he's, this is gonna we'll make this the cover for the next gun club album. Nobody else would, you know what I mean? Others, you know, other record companies have art directors, and they have oh, the guy did the hoy, did the hoy, did the hoy, you know, all this shit to get in the way of everything. So it's really nice to to just be. It was much more casual, and we worked for. Uh, we worked in a studio that cost half. It was half cost half of what uh, per hour of what you of what the going rate at the fancy studios in New York City mm -hmm. are now. So they're going for 200 bucks an hour. 
Do you want to pay 200 bucks an hour? No, but you got to get sound out of what you yeah, and we deal got with. and we we did well, perfectly well, but blank tape for 100 bucks an hour, and plus you couldn't fall into you know the, the I, I, like at the record plant or hit factory or something. They make the chairs so plus you fall asleep listening to your own fucking music. You know what I'm saying? This is not the idea here, is it? You know what I'm saying? No. So you know, they just regular chairs like this, a blank tape, get the work done. Okay, let me go back a few years. Uh, about 1975, you committed yourself to the care of a psychiatrist. Yeah. Okay, how did that... Uh, we're still friends. And you're still friends. Yeah, yeah. His eight, name is Murray... He's kept me alive for eight years now. Okay. <laughs> Murray Zucker. Right. Yeah, I don't think I'm allowed to talk too much about him. He's, that's, that's, isn't that advertising in medicine or something? I don't know. How has it affected your performance as well as your, your personal life? It's good to know I've got a friend. Yeah. <laughs> a friend that I can talk to. <laughs> It's like anytime you want to call home or whatever, That's like right. ET. That's right. Okay. <laughs> that was about the Very same. Very good, like VET. Yeah. yeah. Was that the same My time? My publisher okay. calls me that ET. Yes. About the same time, David Bowie was producing uh, Raw Power for you, I believe. I produced Raw Power. Okay. His name was on it. You produced it. His name, his name, remixed by is on it. It's just produced yeah. by Iggy Pop. Okay. Sorry about that. My music. All right. But at about the same time, you started working with David Bowie a little bit more. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, no, we were getting to know each other, you know? Like, I'm not too easy to get, to, it takes a while with me, a few years, usually. Yeah. Uh, we didn't really work, we didn't really collaborate until uh, The Idiot, you know? And that was total collaboration, his music, my words. And after that, you did Lust for Life, mm -hmm. which was yeah, another collaboration. Yeah, I, I really had fun doing that. I thought that would get a lot more play in America than it did, but uh, for some reason the stations liked the more somnolent, you know, that even the, the tone of the idiot. I think too because my voice sounded like a DJ. You yeah, your, vo your voice changed quite dramatically on those two albums, I think. Uh, well, what happened, oh, you mean from one to the other? Yeah. From A Lust for Life, I went back up high. Well, I had used to always had this voice like Bugs Bunny, you know, and I go, hey, come on, wait, one, two, three, four, blah, 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 blah. And then you sound and like then, Frank Sinatra. Then I got, I, I started noticing when I was about in 70, 1973, when I was 20, uh, something, 25, call it. Yeah, 25. Uh, I noticed this thing I was able to do with my voice, it was starting to get lower, you know, I had sort of, and, it, and then I didn't make records for two years, not really. Unless you count, uh, you know, Metallic KO. Metallic KO, yeah. Yeah, which was just really just a, uh, kind of reissue. You know, they put yeah. something I'd done in 75. And uh, by 77, I really had a strong, I don't know, I guess I grew up or something. I don't know, I, so I could go either way. But then I got sick of that. I thought, well, one album of that's enough. I thought, I think I'll sing like this again. <laughs> you know? Sound a country there. Oh, yeah, I can mimic just about anything I want to. You know, in 1979, I read a few interviews with you, and you had said at that point that in 20 years you wanted to be playing Las Vegas. Uh, is that still a, a priority in I'll your life? I'll play anywhere. I'll play anywhere. I don't give. I don't care. You and Jerry Lewis, I guess. Huh? Well, no, actually, it's. I'm, I didn't mean Vegas. And I'll tell you what's happened. Las Vegas is. You're here. <laughs> this, is, this is Vegas. This is it, boy. It's come to San Antonio. There's an explosion all over America. Of, of these a proliferation of little clubs like this or little halls or wherever I am. I haven't looked yet, you know? But, the but, 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 that, but, that, uh, but, that, but that, that present, uh, that present music by, by young, by young, young people for young people and it's, but it's just like Vegas. Is it drinking? But this is the Vegas it's, of our age, our yeah, generation. It's, it's drinking, it's, it's not like concerts. When I started out with concerts, everybody said, now this is, this is a saloon, man. I've seen saloons. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was always hard to, to sit at your conscience anyway. Yeah, who you wants to... to sit around and, you know what I mean? I can't bear that. You know? You know? You know? And then, like, here, I'll be in, like, try to watch the Rolling Stones in an amphitheater and drop your coke or something. <laughs> under my shoe. They're the under my thumb. my drugs, you know? I don't know. God, you know, and you get beat on, but it's, it's the saloons are really make the, uh, a lot more sense. Yeah. I've done I've done some of my some of my best shows since all these it's just like been you know, overnight. It's been about two years, three years now. This is just Boers Run. Is that the correct pronunciation of that word? Of what? B U R G E O N. Bourgeois. 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 Yeah, when something I don't know. It's like, you know, when something mushrooms. 
mushroom. Let's just say mushroom, yeah, okay? It's only mushrooms. Let me ask you a question here. I recently talked with Robbie Krieger, the former guitar player for the Doors. He said at one time, yeah. uh, after Jim Morrison died in 1970, mm -hmm. that they were considering you as a replacement for him. Do you see yourself as uh, sort of an extension of Jim Morrison's legacy and the rock and roll shaman? There's a connection there, I suppose, yeah. 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 Nobody acts like uh, well, no, it's just a connection that, you know, I mean, I could talk about it in terms of like, you know, like uh, if I was some guy that worked at a company or something, you know, because I don't work, I pull in. I play. It's the difference, you know. Uh, no, I don't have a job or anything. So I don't think like some people would think, well, let's see, you know, uh, yeah, I'm putting you over here and stuff. But the reason I would say there's a connection is because, see, I believe like that uh, it's a very human thing, you know, it's music good music and when it was when really when I saw it was I've always I've always said this I mean when I was when I saw Mick Jagger play I wanted to be a lead singer and when I saw Morrison play I had to I had to I said I have to go out and do it now and he affected me just very deeply as a person uh, I get very uh, you know, really affected me very deeply and so I think that what are we as people anyway but the sum total of whatever we like? Hopefully not too much of the part of whatever we don't like. You know, so so uh, so that's that's what I would say that connection would be. When he started you understand out... understand what I'm saying? Yeah, definitely. You know what I'm trying to say? I think I do. You know? I was going to ask you a, a, a question about the song Passenger, which yeah. is on Lust for Life. That's and that had a very... Poems. It was. Yeah, I took that from a Jim Moore, a poem in uh, the, Lords the Lords and the New Creatures. I thought yeah. I recognized it. There was a poem, We Are All Passengers, and, uh, and Life is a Journey by Car, and uh, it's about how people, everybody gets in their car, and nobody can get out. Well, it had a and very driving feel. the journey goes on, everybody starts to stink. <laughs> and reek, reek was the word he used. But yeah. yeah he was very poet. Yeah, I took of... that, I, I sat, I wrote that in Berlin, in the Andres Ufa, sitting, Thing, yeah, what can I write about today? <laughs> that's a good subject. And you lived in Berlin for a few years, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, Off that's on. the best place. It's my favorite city on earth. How did that affect your, your way of writing? Uber Alice, your... baby. You know? <laughs> did it affect your writing the way... Uh... Hipper was a vegetarian. <laughs> Who was? Are you, are you a vegetarian? No, I'm not. I'm an omnivore. Okay. I'll eat anything. Not even, not dog food though, probably. You know, I, I tried some. Hey, Rob, this guy wrote the music. That's the one. This guy, the, Rob Dupree. This is the experimentalist here, yes. <laughs> How you doing? Because the nasty experimentalist. Have we had enough, do you think, enough time? Or you, did you get most yeah, of it? It's whatever they want. Okay, great. Everything's rolling weirdly. Maybe I can ask you one more question, okay, though. Sure. Okay, let me find it, though. Okay, you said that death doesn't kill you, that it's indifference and boredom that do you, and is it uh, pretty much your philosophy and all your music is what you're trying to convey? I'd rather be dead. Actually, what I, what I wanted to say was that was actually my publisher paraphrase. We had a big fight over that. From your, uh, your own book, uh, it was I Need More? It was one of, yes, it was one of my notes. We were going, we were going through uh, the layout, and it was one of my notes, but it wasn't what I really wanted. What I really wanted to say is I'd rather be dead than bored. Definitely. The chairman of the board. I'd rather be dead any time, man. Give it to me any time. I don't care what, but I'd rather be, I'd rather fucking croak than have to, like, just sort of... Puddle log and cheese. No, who am I? I don't know. Oh, what do I own? I don't know. What is this? I don't know. You know, I don't. That, that is that. That's that, definitely not Iggy Pop. Boredom to me. Boredom to me is disorient. Boredom is a, a synonym for disorientation. In the end, I think that somebody could make a good. Now, somebody could make a good argument. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe you're only alive when you're. Oriented, scared. Yeah. No, when you're maybe you're only alive when you're disoriented. I don't know, but yeah, it's, it's you know, I'd, I'd rather be dead. You know, I'm very anti-boredom. I know you're a big golf it tends fan. To uh, exhaust, I, I exhaust myself. Yeah, I am a big golfer. Yeah. Yeah. I, I exhaust myself. Yeah, I am a big golfer. Yeah. Yeah. What's your handicap? Oh shit, these days it must be like 14 or something. 14. I okay. shoot like you know, I 80s. You know, I'm, yeah. I I don't play enough. I do it with my own hand. Cause it's something we can do, and because I like, I like the outdoors, and I like the poetry of the game. You know? I like the precision. And, well, you know, everybody's got something they did when they were. I mean, uh, 
Yeah. Somebody said you like soap opera. Yeah. Funny they did before they were Iggy Pop. You know? Now what would Iggy Pop be doing? Would he be working at a McDonald's or something if he wasn't on stage? I, I applied to McDonald's in uh, 1975, and they wouldn't have me. Not even as a manager? Well, I, this is what I told them. I wrote on my resume. I said I'm sure that if you'll all just, you know, if you just give me this opportunity now, that I'll be running a little major branch of the company within a few years, and you need men like me who can sell. No. Now, did you look like this when that you applied for the, the job? Way, that was not the way to come out to McDonald's. I didn't want to know. They wanted a nice, they wanted a, a nice, quiet high school graduate with it to serve the burger. Now there were a lot of policemen. <laughs> no, they were. They were. Uh, okay. They were hiring a lot of. They hired a lot of ex-cops at that particular one. I'm Pico Boulevard, Pico, Los Angeles. Los Angeles, yeah. yeah. I filled out my application because I got up to one day. I was really excited. I hadn't had a, I hadn't had anything to do or a gig or a, nothing in six, eight months. Just nobody, you know, nothing happened. This in 1969 after your first album came no, out. No, this was in 1975. Uh, oh, okay. 74, 75, and. Uh, and it's like, help wanted. I thought, yeah, all right. You know, right in the neighborhood. There's the answer, you know. I just saw it, but nope. One last question. Are you a big soap opera fan? I heard you were and hit a lot of... Oh, I, I was watching. I watched I, I watched General Hospital when it was a little before it was chic, you know, about uh, a year ago. I got, I got sick of all that. Huh? You don't like As the World Turns? I figured no, you might I'm be a big a little... John Dixon fan. I shroud my TV off. And I usually take just a surprise hat jacket here and just hang it gently over the thing. I, I keep a typewriter in my room. On the road, typewriter, a voice recorder, uh, and a, a small music recorder, a guitar, and pig nose, and that's that's enough for my entertainment. Okay. I'm a little real leery of the fucking tube, you know, because I can get like. I guess when you tour, there's not too much else to do sometimes. Iggy Pop no longer watches soap operas. He's a rock and roll, non parallel performer. Ron Young, San Antonio Light.